grace and peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Before we get started with worship, we have just a couple announcements. Uh, forefront on everyone's mind is when are we going to be back in our buildings? When are we going to be back to in-person worship on Sundays? Uh, we will be virtual next Sunday, February 14th. Um, but then we will be having uh, Ad Council meetings, the first of which will be Ulster's Ad Council. That'll be this coming Tuesday, February 9th at 6 p.m. Minroton's Ad Council will meet the following Tuesday, the 16th at 2 p.m. And then New Albany will meet, their leadership team will meet that same day, uh, the 16th at 6 p.m. We're moving their meeting up a week. During these meetings, we'll be discussing the guidelines for reopening that have been provided by the bishop. We'll be determining when it will be the right time uh, to return to worshiping in person. But know that even when we do return to in-person -person worship, we will continue to offer online worship as well. And um, we will keep you posted on how those dis discussions go. Another um, announcement, another continuing announcement is our Bible study. We are continuing with that on Zoom. It's been wonderful. We've had um, people from Florida and New York and all over Pennsylvania. It's a wonderful way that, um, that we can still gather, even if we're separated, not just by COVID, but by distance as well. We meet on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. You're welcome to join in, but you need to let me know so I know who I'm inviting into the meeting. This week, we're going to look at a familiar story for some. Uh, it's the rich man and Lazarus, and that's from Luke chapter 16. As we continue, though, in, this week, in these next couple of weeks, know that Ash Wednesday is February 17th. That's the beginning of Lent, which will lead us into Easter. So during that time, the Wednesday Bible study will be more of a Lenten, um, a Lenten discipline, a Lenten focus. Also, on that Wednesday, on February 17th, on Ash Wednesday, we will have worship, but it will be virtual. So please tune in for that. Uh, I'll send out the, the link is normal. Um, I'm hoping it will be available by noon. Uh, and just so you know, you don't have to have ashes on hand. We'll work through that during the service. One concern that is a, very much a concern for all of our churches these days are finances. We encourage you, please, if you are able to give, if you normally give to our churches, then please continue to do so, even if you need to send your offering through the mail. So let's begin our worship. As we do, I want you to know this week, or last week, I challenged you to watch the sun's sunrise, talk to the sunrise, command the sunrise. Uh, this past week, as I was watching one of those sunrises, um, I sat by our big window looking east. It took a long time. The sun was not listening to my impatience. And the sun, sky, though, seemed bright before I could actually see the sun. I was waiting for the sunrise that it seemed like, well, it's already happened. I must have missed it. You see, we live in a bit of a valley. And so the sun rises over the hill and then behind a silo and it's up in the sky before it really is visible at the horizon. But then I looked the other direction. I looked west and those hills were glowing even before the sun had been visible. The snow was pink and purple. It was beautiful. And I realized that sometimes even if we can't see the sun at its rising, we can see its light brightly in places that we might not have expected it. Isn't this true of God's presence in our lives too? We may look for it where we expect it to appear, but aren't we often surprised to see evidence of it sh shining brightly, making the world beautiful in places that we least expect it? Today, as we begin worship, we look for hope even in the midst of a freezing winter, even as the snow is falling. And we look at the dead trees for signs of life. Please join me in the opening prayer. It's Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? 
How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Amen. The first hymn this morning is Spirits. <laughs> come to God in both joy and with great concerns. We know both. We can lift our joys in praise, but we can also lift our deepest worries, our deepest cares to God, knowing that he hears our prayers, knowing that he loves us deeply. I encourage you to reach out to those around you, those there watching with you or those watching somewhere else, those unable to. Reach out, share those ways God is working in your lives, share the concerns that, you sh that, that each of you have, lift them together to God who hears. And we go to God in prayer. God, we do thank you. We thank you for your steadfast love. We thank you for the confidence we can have in your presence, that you do hear our prayers, that you do listen and provide a way forward, that you provide. God, we thank you. We thank you for offering us joy, not only in a lifetime to come, but within this lifetime, even in the midst of troubled days. We thank you for the hope that you continue to show us. We thank you for the ways that you continue to show us your presence, even in places we least expect. God, we share the joys the joys of longer days, the joys of vaccines being distributed. We share the joys 
of hearing songs from the birds changing to spring. But God, we also lift you, our worries, our concerns, our deepest prayers. We lift them to you, knowing you hear them, knowing you know what will happen, what will come. God, we lift to you prayers for all those who are feeling isolated, especially as this time drags on. We lift to you those who are physically not well. Because of COVID or for some other reason, we offer them to you for healing. God, we lift to you those who are, are suffering from anxiety, from depression, from addiction from all those things that trap us in darkness. Help your light to shine, to shine through. Can we lift you those families who are mourning loss of loved ones? Help them to remember with confidence the promise that they have in you. Help them to remember with joy. And God, we do ask continued prayers for our church, for the communities of our church, as we are needing to make difficult decisions, as we are facing difficult times financially, as we are struggling to be the church you want us to be, even when it's not obvious how. God, help us. Help us to remember that you have connected us together as a community that is stronger because we are bound together. And help us to remember that we move forward together with each other and with you. God, we lift all these things in your name, in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the letter of James. It's chapter 5, verses 7 through 20. Hear these words. Be patient, then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You, too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord, Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have, been, who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is the word of God 
for the people of God. So suppose you had no idea what day you've been born on. Maybe it was back before records like this were kept, or maybe the day uh, was smudged out on your birth certificate. If you weren't sure of the date, what date would you choose? Maybe sometime in the spring. Summer's good for pool parties, right? I feel for those people who are born on leap day. This year, they don't get a birthday at all. I heard a podcast last year focused on this dilemma. Apparently, it is accepted practice just to pick a day. Usually, it's February 28th or the 1st of March, but and then on leap year, you get to celebrate twice. You get to choose. In Scripture, in the book of Leviticus, which lays out many of the laws that govern the Israelite people, it says, when you enter the land and plant any kind of fruit tree, regard its fruit as forbidden. For three years, you're to consider it forbidden. It must not be eaten. In the fourth year, all its fruit will be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat its fruit. In this way, your harvest will be increased. I am the Lord, your God. Easy enough, right? Three years, let the tree grow stronger. The fourth year, offer the fruit to God. And the fifth year, you can start harvesting it for yourself, self for profit. So if you have one tree, a pet of sorts, you might remember the day you planted it. Maybe even have a little party with some friends every year to celebrate. But what happens if you add to your orchard and you have many trees, many trees? It's sort of like remembering all the birthdays of your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. It's not an easy task to keep track of the third year and the fourth year and the fifth year. And how do you remember for each tree? To make it easier to keep track of, one day was designated as the birthday of all the trees that were planted for food. It's the birthday of the trees. It's the new year of the trees. It dates back even to ancient Israel. And it falls on the 15th day of the month of Shvat. This is the full moon of midwinter. This year, it was January 28th. We just missed it. Since its destruction in the first century, offerings have not been made at the temple in Jerusalem. But this new year of the trees is still celebrated as a minor holiday. It marks the coming of the spring, and it's when people are reminded of the provision and the blessings of God, even without the temple to bring an offering to. This holiday gained added significance in the mid-1900s, when the Jewish people began to return to Israel as a nation. Planting trees on this holiday was a means of restoring a desolate land and of nourishing hope for the people, since millions of saplings are planted every year. It seems strange, though, doesn't it, to plant trees in the middle of winter? But in Israel, this is the end of the rainy season. The soil holds the moisture that the young trees need to thrive. Here, though, Northern Pennsylvania, not so much. I can't even imagine putting anything in the ground right now. We haven't even seen the ground since December. It's snowing again today. And even the trees that are already grown, they look dead and lifeless and barren. We're only at the midpoint of the winter. Everything is still frozen. We know there's at least six more weeks of winter, right? We had the prediction this week. But how appropriate to focus on hope now. Now, this day, these days. The days are beginning to grow noticeably longer. The icicles are beginning to drip some days at high noon. But still, they're beginning. Soon enough, we know that the crocuses are going to push above the snow. We know. We know that spring is under there somewhere, 
under the snow and the ice, under the frozen ground. We know that the trees are starting to come back to life. The maple producers know this. They tap trees even before the, they hear the first pings of the sap. Life is thawing at the roots and it's starting to flow up through the trees again to buds that are waiting to explode. Even though we can't see it, we can trust that it's happening. The trees are coming to life. James instructs this early church to be patient, not just waiting at the grocery store kind of patient or on the list to get a vaccine, but enduring patiently enduring like we do through the winter for the spring. For James's church, it wasn't waiting for spring though. They were deep in a season of hardship. They were oppressed and poor. They were struggling. They were seeing people thriving around them because they were living by this world's values and taking advantage because they were powerful. And this church was being told to be patient. But how can they live as a Christian community during the barren time, during the patient waiting? Not as the world around them full of greed and violence, but as a community founded on the love of Christ. The Lord who is coming to judge is coming to judge. We can hear the same instructions for ourselves and our own churches today. How do we live as we wait? How do we live as we wait through this difficult season? As we wait for the easing of the pandemic, as we wait for the reopening of our churches, as we wait for a return to normal-ish? First, we can have confidence in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who hears our prayers. Jesus Christ who is compassionate and merciful. Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with a community to support us, the Lord who heals and forgives. Second, we wait as righteous believers, those who do the right thing, those who continue to live in and live out the love of Christ, even if the world around us doesn't, even if the world around us criticizes us, condemns us, for living the right way. Third, as we wait, we live as a community, not grumbling with each other. Like those that James teaches in this church, the stress and strain, the worry and uncertainty, these were creating division. These create division for us too. They inspire blame and contempt. But we cannot, we cannot allow the grumbling to destroy the community ordained to hold us up in the waiting. We need each other during this waiting. Instead, James gives us a better way. James tells us, pray for each other, praise with each other, and call on each other. Call on each other. Our churches seem a bit like winter trees right now, closed up, empty, looking lifeless. Over these next couple of weeks, we will be discerning the appropriate timing and path for reopening. But there is such a struggle. There is a struggle of wanting to be back in our churches, back in person, back in the fellowship and worship with each other. There's a worry over finances. But these need to also be balanced with health concerns, emotional health concerns too, and the uncertainty of what is still coming, maybe coming. We've all seen the apple trees in full bloom in the spring and known the dread of late frosts that melt the flowers and rob us of fruit. We long for our churches to be full of life again, to be producing fruit again. But first, we need life to flow up through them. First, 
We need to be nourished by and through the Holy Spirit before that life can emerge through a community that is healthy and strong together. Like trees that are renewed in seeming defiance of the winter, we can and we will emerge alive if we draw on our foundation, the roots that have nourished us through every season so far. This is the lesson for us from the new year of the trees. We are not planting trees, though, are we? <laughs> not really. But together we should be cultivating hope. And not just for ourselves, not just for our churches. The original purpose of this holiday was so that folks would know when to offer first fruits in praise of God. Trees were allowed to grow for three years for the sake of the tree. On the fourth year, the offering was for the sake of the temple, of the community. And only after the fifth year, personal provision or profit. But if you only eat on the fifth year or after the fifth year, are you expected to starve until then? Four years of waiting for a harvest? No, you're not expected to starve. During that time of waiting, you would eat of the trees that were planted by the generation before you. Often this holiday is celebrated, even today, by planting trees in honor, honor and memory of loved ones and friends. We eat because someone planted for us but we plant so someone else can eat. The harvest is never all our own. James says, encourage us, encourages us, encourages us <laughs> to strengthen our hearts. Strengthen our hearts. More than anyone, we have hope because Jesus has shown us hope. Jesus has shown us that there is hope in what seems hopeless. There is life in what seems dead. Even here, in the depths of the winter, in the midst of pandemic, even in uncertainty, even in these times, we can listen for the sap rising. We can look for and start to see signs all around that what has been promised is already being fulfilled and we can celebrate. We can praise God joyfully together that deep beneath the cold and the dark, God is already working, life is already rising, hope is alive. Hope is alive. Amen, amen. The closing hymn this morning is my hope is built.
if you were wondering what the apple was about, hope, let me show you, hopefully safely. I'll show you half the apple. <laughs> so there is an expression that says we may be able to count the seeds in an apple. <laughs> Didn't quite get them. But only God can count the apples in each seed. Only God can count the apples in each seed. God knows more than we can ever dream of knowing. God knows the potential. I have heard so many people wanting desperately to get back into our churches, back for worship, back just to be in the presence of a sacred space, back to the fellowship. Please be patient. God knows our longing. God hears our prayers, we will be back. But one of the motivators to get back to church is finances, too. The argument is the people don't support the church if the doors are closed. Unfortunately, this leads to grumbling, doesn't it? I want you to consider these apple seeds. No one would say, I'll wait until I have fruit before I plant seeds. I'll wait until after the harvest to water the trees. It doesn't work like that. We must continue to support our churches, even while we wait. Even if we can't quite see how this is working out. No. Know that Jesus Christ is working in us and through us, even before we can see it. Even before we can see it. He is the source of all life. And Jesus Christ is the source of our eternal hope. Keep healthy. Keep connected. Keep the faith.